Hey all, this is Darren. I'm the head of remote here at GitLab. Uh, thank you very much for joining today. Uh, the presentation we're gonna be going over is a fun one for me. It's something I've lived for many, many years and I love evangelizing and sharing more about it. Uh, and that is implementing and reinforcing remote first practices. So we're gonna try to reserve some time at the end for questions uh, in the Google doc. I see some have already been prepared. I love Q and A, that's my favorite thing. So I'll try to get to those. So with that, let's dive in. So I'm Darren, I've worked across the spectrum of remote for my entire career, so over 15 years now. When I started working remotely, 3G was not yet invented and my laptop battery lasted about 17 or 18 minutes. So the world has changed quite a bit over time and it's been amazing to watch the evolution of remote and particularly over the past six months, I think we've been catapulted ahead maybe 10 or 15 years thanks to COVID-19 and a lot of the world is now coming to grips with uh, what a lot of us at GitLab have already been doing for a long time. For those that have not seen it, the remote playbook was developed earlier this year uh, when COVID-19 hit. We wrapped all of our best learnings and educational material that I had written over the past year into a handy dandy ebook called the remote playbook. Uh, on, there's a credits page at the back of that. I would encourage you to look at that. A lot of people at GitLab contributed to that. Uh, and it's an easy guide to send people who are struggling right now in the remote transition. It gives them a single source to go to, to start digging in. And of course, then the rabbit hole is very deep, but it has, uh, has been awesome for a lot of companies. They have used it as a blueprint to start mapping transition. So I wanted to start this with a quote that we serve up during onboarding, which is those who thrive at GitLab take the opportunity to drop prior workplace baggage at the door, embrace a liberating and empowering set of values, and give themselves permission to truly operate differently. There is as much to unlearn as there is to learn. And I remember when I got to GitLab, I thought I had this remote thing figured out and iteration still uh, had my number. It took me quite a bit of time to figure iteration out, to truly operate with a low level of shame, work with no ego, put things out there in draft. And it turns out all of those things are really core to working well remotely. They may not seem directly related to the workplace and infrastructure of remote, <clears throat> but it turns out they actually are. And it improves discipline, it improves, improves transparency, and it improves cohesion. So I want to touch on a first uh, first on a few remote realities. Remote can feel counterintuitive. It just feels way different than your last job. We like to write things down instead of verbalizing. We prefer async over a synchronous meeting. There are a lot of things that go into this. And so what I try to tell people is if it feels a bit awkward, you're probably doing it right. Similar with iteration, if you put something forward and you're a little bit ashamed of how basic it is, you're probably doing it right. You're putting it out there early so you can get feedback on it and it can become even better. The second thing is it's not a trap. A lot of things that we do at GitLab uh, would get you in a lot of trouble in other organizations. Uh, answering someone with a link, for example, may seem very cold at another organization, but here it's just a model of efficiency and it's being respectful of other, other people's time. And it's reinforcing that we do truly try to work handbook first to take all of our time zones into account and operate as the most inclusive team that we possibly can. The third is that rewiring takes time. As I mentioned earlier, it took me a few months to really dial into what iteration is and I'm actually still learning. I think we all are. are. And working remote first, it really does require trust in your team, a level of vulnerability that you may not be familiar with or comfortable with initially. Give yourself some time, talk it out. There's a remote channel that we have here uh, in Slack. We have a lot of awesome remote veterans in there that are more than happy to answer questions and help if you're struggling with some of these remote first workflows. And lastly, reinforcement is okay. Sometimes you'll see someone at here or at channel and without a doubt, within 60 seconds, someone will kindly respond to that with a link to our communications handbook that says, and we don't do that unless it is absolutely urgent and here's how we actually communicate with each other. It's okay to do that. It's course correcting, reinforcement is okay. If you look into our sub values, don't let each other fail and help each other succeed or both in there and we take those seriously in a remote world. Three foundational elements. So for context here, when I'm giving presentations to other organizations outside of GitLab, I always use this slide to try to ground them on what the three focal areas are. Because the truth is remote work 
as a whole is very daunting to try to wrap your head around the entirety of remote work. And for companies making a suddenly remote transition, a lot of them are trying to bite the entire thing off at once, and that's not recommended. So I give them the advice that even the transition to remote is a journey of iteration. And so if you've recently joined GitLab and you yourself are making a transition into an all remote space, if you've spent a lot of time in a co-located or a hybrid space, that is also a journey of iteration. And it is okay to remember that. You don't have to have everything perfect from day one. There is a lot to learn and some of it just comes with time. You need to be here long enough to see different things, to hear different things, to have different opportunities to work on different projects and get into different workflows. Uh, I like the, the term reverse engineering. I was not a user of GitLab before I joined. And what I really loved is digging into the MR Buddies channel and just watching merge requests be solved. And I would look at the diffs and I would look at what the expert would do to change it. And then I would try to reverse engineer that to build my own knowledge of how to actually be better at using GitLab. So the three foundational elements that you have to get right, workspace. GitLab is awesome in that we allow you to expense what you need to build the workspace that works for you, to build a healthy and ergonomic workspace. That is amazing. A lot of companies that were office first that have transitioned to remote now, they are struggling to figure out, do we do a stipend? What do we do? Do we just wait for people to get back to the office? So take advantage of that. And even the workspace is a journey of iteration. My workspace did not look like this a few months ago. I was at a different room in my home. We have a toddler. He was growing up. He figured out that I was always in there and he would get really upset that he couldn't come in 24 seven. So we actually moved it. I did some iteration on the workspace and now it's a much more sane place for me. Uh, it's a mental health boost and it keeps him in his happy spot. He can be downstairs, live his best life, and I can be up here working. The second is communications. Communications is different in, a, in an all remote environment. We use text very heavily. I love that we're leaning into audio first platforms like Yak and video first platforms like Loom. Feel free to try those out and pilot those, experiment with those. We're always looking to iterate and get better. But it's really important that we have guidelines on where work communication happens and where informal communication happens. We are blessed that we have GitLab at the heart of all that we do so we can funnel all of our work into GitLab. But I also love that we expire our Slack messages after 90 days so that we use it primarily for informal communication. If you wanna see how this really works in practice, check out the In the Parenthood Slack channel. That is an amazing place where parents all over the world who are doubling as teacher's aides right now are commiserating with each other, laughing with each other, crying with each other, and helping each other out as we all sort of go through this uncharted territory together. Now in a common workspace, you may not use Slack that way. You may feel a bit uncomfortable just connecting as humans in, a, in an environment like Slack. But because we deliberately expire our Slack messages after 90 days, it's really not great for work. So it's mostly only useful for informal communication. So I would encourage you to dive into Slack. We have tons of different topical channels. Mental Health Aware is a great one. Daily Gratitude is a great one. We have fitness, cooking, video games, dogs, cats, cute photos, you name it. Uh, dig in there. Surely you'll find something you like. And also we have a lot of location channels. So if you're in the Pacific Northwest or Southern California, other areas around the world, check that out. You'll probably find a pocket of people nearby. And once travel restrictions are lifted, it's really awesome to get together every now and again, hang out, co-work together, that sort of thing. The last is mindset. I often tell people that remote work is half tooling and half culture and mindset. We are really blessed at GitLab that our executive team has the mindset of driving remote first practices. It truly does have to be modeled at the top. Thankfully, our executives do that. But if you're a manager and you're a leader somewhere in the organization, remember that the culture and the mindset around remote first practices starts with you. And if you want to dig into the handbook to learn more about what that takes, I would say check out our leadership pages, our awesome learning and development team. They're building new stuff all of the time. Really, really awesome stuff on managerial training and how to truly have the mindset of remote first and to always think about other people to be inclusive. Are there, is there anyone I'm not considering in a different time zone, so on and so forth. That gets seen and reinforced and then lived down throughout the organization. All right, five things to remember when working remote first. I'm gonna speed up here so we can uh, save some time for questions. We wanna reduce reliance on Slack and synchronicity strategically. The bottom line here is synchronous time is really precious. 
It's really great for coffee chats, but we want to make sure we you have enough mental energy to actually engage in those. So we try to think about synchronicity in terms of if I'm going to have a synchronous meeting, will it catalyze a lot of asynchronous work after? So be strategic about weaving async and sync together. It's not a sync versus async. It's strat strategically using them both. And if you check out our asynchronous guide, I'm actually in the middle of an async 3.0 initiative where we are codifying how different teams around the organization strategically use async to gain more efficiency. Try not to default to a meeting. If you immediately think, hey, let's have a meeting. First, I would say write down what you wanted to meet about and then see if it's possible to get the answer or come to the outcome using written form. The benefit here is you save yourself double work. If you have a meeting about something and an outcome is achieved, someone has to write that down so that it goes into the right place in the handbook. So if possible, start the work where it needs to end up. GitLab issues or merge request, write it down first. Remember, we try to separate consensus gathering from decision making. And consensus gathering can be done asynchronously most of the time. You can write down what you're thinking about, send it out to the most amount of people, and allow a time boxed amount of feedback, and then maybe have one synchronous meeting at the end to actually decide on all of the feedback that was gained. If you have a meeting, do it well. Make sure that you document it. Make sure that there is someone in there responsible for codifying the takeaways and putting them in the relevant places in the handbook immediately. Knowledge tends to have uh, a quick decay. And so we try to get that in as soon as possible. Try to always answer with a link. I love doing these sessions and getting questions from people and immediately thinking, I know that there's a link for that. If you're struggling on using the handbook and answering with a link, we actually have a handbook page on how to search and use the handbook. It's like handbook inception. So find that, dig into that. You can become a handbook pro in no time. And last but certainly not least, read and live the GitLab sub values. I say this often, but our six core values are probably words that you've heard before, collaboration, iteration, results, but they can mean different things to different people. Where it's really dialed in is in the sub values, which we think of as substantiators to each of our values. These are incredible. Almost no other organization in the world has detailed their values in a way that GitLab does, and we allow them to evolve. You can contribute a new way to substantiate any other value in there. And even in my time here, I have contributed some, and I've seen some amazing ones come in from others. Really take time to read that. It is amazing how many conflicts and how many issues can be resolved if you just look at the sub-values and take the advice there. It's been built up over years and years. It is an amazing wealth of knowledge. So I dug in a little bit on Slack and synchronicity. I'm going to uh, pass through these slides a little bit. I want to make sure we have time for questions. We can send this deck out afterwards and you can digest it in true asynchronous fashion. So we touched on do not defaulting to a meeting. So we'll send these slides around. That way you can dig in a little bit more. Hey, check this out. Aloha day. I'm actually wearing an Aloha shirt today. We need to get another Aloha day on the books. Answering with a link, another one of my favorites. Just a quick point here that answering with a link is not rude. It's actually very efficient and very respectful of other people's time. And I also like to think about this is if you get a question that truly isn't in the handbook, it's an awesome opportunity to answer the person and then immediately document it so that if anyone has this question henceforth, they simply can find it in the handbook. At scale and extrapolated over time, this is amazingly efficient. And we talked a bit about the GitLab sub values. Thank you all very much for contributing to those. I love our sub values. Just a few things here on informal communication. If you're struggling with isolation or loneliness, uh, we are always adding to our informal communication guide. We recently uh, added the DJ Zoom room. Zoom added this cool feature where you can kind of DJ within a setting so everyone can just kind of be working heads down and kind of pass the baton on who's playing music in the room. If you've ever been in an office where it's like 90s Fridays or something like that, kind of a similar vibe. But check that page out if you have any other things to add, create a merge request and assign it to me. One other piece of work that we did late last year into early this year that I wanted to, to highlight here is the GitLab Remote Work Report. So we surveyed 3,000 people across the world on why they love remote work. And this was before COVID-19. So what I love about this data is it is not colored by the current pandemic. And it is very useful to a lot of people now because it gives insights into the minds of people who are working remotely before all of this happened. So if you have peers or other leaders in your space that are curious about data 
shaping remote work. Tell them to check out the GitLab remote work report. All of the surveys were taken pre-COVID, and so the data is very pure. And last but not least, everyone can contribute. Allremote.info is the shortcut URL into the all remote section of the GitLab handbook. We are growing that every day. Super proud of it. Super happy to see how many contributions have happened. And I can't tell you how many dozens, if not hundreds of companies around the world are literally using this every day to shape their remote transitions. It's a big deal. We are a beacon and a pioneer in the space. And as tens of millions of people go remote, what we write and what we share and how we live is going to impact how other companies are shaped and how they live. It's a big deal. To some degree, we are the Avengers. We're saving the world from imminent demise by showing them how to work remotely. So I would encourage you to continue living those values, dig into the guide. Let me know if you have any questions and certainly make merge requests if you have them. And with that, I'm going to slide over to questions. Emily, do you mind verbalizing some of these or calling some folks out? It would be my pleasure, Darren. And thank awesome. you for sharing some of these, these great insights and learnings. So we have a couple of questions. The first is from Phoebe Burks. Darren, can you please talk about how GitLab's value of transparency is important for all remote work? Yeah, so amazing question. It is a non-negotiable thing in remote work. Transparency is key to people feeling like they belong. It is key for feeling like they are connected to the work and the people and the projects that are happening. And the truth is, this has always been the case, even in co-located spaces. The more transparency, the more people feel like they belong, the more purpose that they have in their work. It's not rocket science, but in remote, it is non-negotiable. In a co-located space, you cannot do this, but then you can band-aid the problem and kind of create this ad hoc solution by having a lot of meetings and continually looping yourself in the various conversations that are going on. So that way you feel like you're in the know and you feel like you're included. But the systemic issue is it should have been public by default. It should have been more transparent from the get-go. And in a remote setting, we have to do that. So I love uh, the notion of transparency. That took some getting used to as well, working out in the open. Uh, but now we have a metric on messages that we want shared in a public channel or either a group setting as opposed to a direct message. We actually track those metrics and we're trying to get better at that. And I love that. I actually see that as a game, as a challenge. I try to operate and work in public channels as often as I possibly can, because you'll see that people, even outside of your workspace, could see your work and then they'll think, oh, I have an idea, I can contribute to that. And it is really amazing, the magic that comes with that. The first time you see someone who you've never worked with before, see the work that you're working on and contribute to it and make it better, you're an immediate, an immediate believer. So I would say, if you're struggling with that, have some faith, take a chance, have some vulnerability, make your work public and watch the magic that happens. Together, I love make it. Make magic together. Hashtag teamwork, hashtag dream work. <laughs> Our next question is from Rebecca, who's not in the session, but we're gonna share this doc asynchronously after. Uh, Darren, why did GitLab choose remote first so long ago, relatively speaking, and what prepared the leadership team to be pioneers in remote first? So it probably wouldn't surprise you that I can answer this with a link. If you go to the GitLab history page, there's an entire section there where I mostly transcribed an interview from Sid who answered this exact question. So out of Sid's mouth, this answer came and I tried to transcribe it. So I would encourage you to go there, check that out. But the long and short of it is, it wasn't intentional. It just sort of happened. Uh, GitLab started with people in various countries. Sid thought maybe they would just come to his house in the Netherlands, but then there was a long commute and it just stopped happening when Y Combinator happened and a small group of people came out of that in California. They were given an office, but it didn't take long for people to stop showing up and the work still got done. So it just sort of happened. And then Sid was visionary enough to start writing things down and documenting things early. And it is amazing now to look at our 7,000 plus page handbook and think how much more efficient and informed our lives are now for things that were written down years and years and years ago. So documentation may feel less efficient in the moment, but if you change your time scale from this very moment to the length of the company, 
it becomes more efficient. And the extrapolated compounding effect of that is really, really powerful over time. A lot of companies that I'm consulting with say, I don't have time for documentation, or this actually makes it less efficient if I have to pause and write things down. But that's because their time scale is the current 30 minutes or the current hour. They're not thinking about tomorrow or the next week or the week after. Last week I was on PTO and all of the things I have written down enabled my team and surrounding teams to move various projects forward because it was already written down. That is the power of documentation. So I, I digressed a little bit there, but hopefully that was useful context. Great question. I think documentation is super important, and that's why we have these notes docs to document everything. Um, our next question is from Tony. Uh, what have been the biggest hurdles for being not only all remote, but using a zero trust model for systems access? I've only worked for companies that, while partially in the cloud, leverage VPNs uh, or a network perimeter really heavily. Yeah, to be honest, this would be a better question for our business operations team. I have consulted and synced up with them uh, on, on some occasions, but I will say this, GitLab benefits from being all remote from the start. So we're not converting anything. It was always set up to work this way. So we had to make our systems and security and two factor, it had to work with no one in an office because we didn't have anyone in an office, but I would say dig into the business operations handbook page and the security pages. They really do an amazing job of detailing uh, what they do and check out a group conversation and or an AMA with them. But that's a great question. Next up, we have Max with remote work. Most of, uh, with, mo uh, with remote work, most of the nonverbal communication is lost. I don't see the faces of my colleagues throughout the whole working day. I don't see subtle gestures and facial expressions during meetings. How do you compensate for this information loss? How do you teach newcomers to cope with remote only communications? I would say this is why we try to encourage video. Um, video goes a long way to conveying verbal cues. I mean, you can see I talk with my hands a lot. McBride does this. We laugh at each other when we're in these sessions. It's just like two people throwing their hands around all the time. Um, so you do get some of that through video. Uh, sometimes we hit Zoom burnout and you just need to dial into a call and that's okay. Uh, I will say this, in-person matters a lot and GitLab is very intentional about integrating in-person engagements that we have those, we build a lot of rapport, we build relationships, and then that carries us until the time we meet again. Now, during COVID, this has wrecked everything. We couldn't have an in-person contribute this year, so that's why we're already trying to forecast when will our next ones be. We want to make sure that when we onboard new people, we give them an IOU of you will see someone in person again. This has been an amazing epiphany for a lot of companies that I'm working with that are transitioning. They're essentially trying to figure out how do we build culture and how do we regain this awesomeness of FaceTime without ever seeing anyone in person again. And I would say that's not the approach. In-person matters a lot. People love getting together. I loved being able to go to an in-person GitLab commit. Various people saw each other at meetups and reinvents. Right now, that's a little difficult, but I would say forecasting to a time when travel restrictions are lifted, leverage in-person. Try to have an offsite, try to get to an in-person event. In-person matters a lot, and I'm excited for the next contribute. It's amazing how much you can do virtually if you start with in-person. And so, like everyone else, we're desperate to get some of those moments back on the calendar. So much, Darren. I know we're at time, but I want to give a huge thank you and invite all of our attendees to keep adding questions to the doc. The team, Darren, will all keep looking and uh, and share those responses. Thanks, Darren. Absolutely. Thanks for joining all. Find me in the remote channel or pretty much anywhere on Slack. I appreciate your time.